So today I'll be talking to you about the image corrector. Um, so let me first start off with um, a few slides to summarize uh, what we'll be discussing today, sort of like an abstract for your presentation. Um, just because some of you may have heard of the term image corrector, but some of you um, other microscopists that don't use, routinely use TEM um, or don't have this additional piece of hardware installed in the microscope that you work on um, to fix these aberrations in these lenses. Um, but nonetheless, it is very important to understand uh, that an image corrector actually fixes or addresses aberrations in lenses. So very applicable to a lot of, you know, anything in microscopy. Okay, so um, first, what is an aberration and why is it important? Well, first, oh, let me just, oh, let me try to get a pointer here, laser pointer. Okay, so first we have, uh, looking at these images, these are just, you know, uh, images taken by the Hubble telescope. And uh, you can see in these two images, they're of the same galaxy, but one is a little bit more blurry, blurrier than the other. And so this was an actual image uh, acquired uh, from the Hubble telescope. And after it was launched, it uh, sent back images that look like this. And so um, after, you know, that is definitely scientists were confused and started to investigate why uh, these images were the way that they were. Are. Um, and so they traced this reason, this blurriness came from an error in the manufacture of these lenses, these mirror lenses. It was just shaved a fraction too thin. And so uh, to understand how that affects the, the focusing abilities of these lenses, um, well, let's look at the ideal lens here. And in an, in an ideal lens, all the rays coming from a point in the object plane, uh, it travels to the lens and the lens focuses it at a certain point in the image plane, producing uh, a point that we see here. And now when you have, you know, some aberration in your lenses, it, uh, it's able to focus the lens or the rays, but it focuses it at different uh, positions. So you have different focal lengths here. So you can see um, in this example, um, you'll see that these rays near the optical axis are fo focused, you know, somewhere over here. And while the rays at a greater angle or higher angle um, to the optical axis are focused a lot um, closer or have a shorter focal length here. And so this results in a point, say for example, in the image plane that is more of a disc shape. So it's just kind of blurrier. And that's why images uh, showed up like this. And so um, in, this is a problem as, you know, it, it loses information that could be, uh, that we can get from, uh, from uh, our rays. And so it's good to understand that there are different types of aberrations and each one um, affects your image differently. And so the image or the aberrations that we'll be talking about today are these four. And so there is, um, astigmatism, coma, spherical, and chromatic, so steep so C. And these are um, aberrations that are commonly found in electron microscopes along with, you know, optical microscopes, anything in the field of optics. And so um, what is very uh, important for electron 
lenses is that the spherical lens or the spherical aberration greatly limits the information or the point resolution um, that we are able to achieve. And so um, the point resolution uh, for an uncorrected microscope, you'll see this is the equation, and you'll see that the point resolution is largely defined uh, by the spherical aberration and the wavelength of the electron. And so if your microscope has a lot of spherical aberration, um, even if you uh, increase the wavelength to try to increase your resolution, you can still only achieve a resolution of about one to two angstroms, which is actually quite good. Um, but we'll put a pin in that. And so, oops, uh, what, what we do instead or what uh, researchers have done is, you know, uh, insert a, uh, um, image corrector, so another lens to focus these off uh, these uh, rays into a single point. Okay, so how is this done? Well, um, in optical, regular light microscopy, um, you can change the shape of these lenses. So you, this is kind of like a diagram or cross section of an, a light microscope, and you'll see that these lenses, there's several lenses in here, and they have different shapes. And so that is how um, you can change the path um, that these rays, and the path and the angles that these rays take. Uh, now, but for, for, um, for reasons that we'll discuss in a bit, uh, we cannot change the shape of the electron microscope lenses. And so what instead we do insert another uh, lens system, um, but the, the lenses themselves are a little bit different than what is normally found in like your condens condenser and objective lenses. Um, and so what is important here is that, you know, we know we have all these lenses in your uh, microscope. So in your CTEM, you have your point source, it comes down, and hit your sample, and we it uses the objective lens to uh, convert the the wave function into you know gives you an image on the screen, and so this objective lens is really the main most important lenses in our system uh, to form an image on the image plane. And so what they do is insert this piece of hardware uh, to correct the aberrations for these objective lenses uh, here after the sample. And uh, I just have this up here for STEM because uh, it's kind of the same thing as uh, STEM is the reverse of, of CTEM or conventional TEM or broad beam uh, TEM in which you, know, you have your field source or if, if uh, your yeah, field emission source, your FEG, um, it comes down, it's focused by the objective lens to interact with your sample to produce an image. And so in, in STEM mode, the objective lens uh, is very important to have, uh, it allows you to form a really nice fine probe. And so it's very important to really minimize the aberrations uh, produced by these lens, the, the, this objective lens here before it interacts with the sample. But uh, shown here in pink is where they insert this additional piece of hardware. And so um, by actually making such correctors and inserting them into the microscope, we can see that it really does uh, increase the resolution that we are able to achieve. And so uh, shown here is the uh, phase contrast transfer function. Um, this is normal for uh, TEM um, imaging where you convert you know, spatial frequencies into contrast. And you can see that the uncorrected uh, function, phase contrast function for the, uh, yeah, the uncorrected microscope uh, is, is shown in the dashed line. And then we have the corrected function uh, shown as a solid line. And you can see here that the, um, the uncorrected microscope, the point resolution ends up being around 
two angstroms, we'll say around two angstroms, a little bit more than two angstroms. Um, uh, but for the corrected microscope, we can, it really uh, achieves a greater resolution um, down to around um, the information limit, basically. And so um, after the realization of these correctors, um, they were able to produce images like this, where we're able to see, you know, atomic information. And so here we have a gallium arsenic crystal and um, the spacing between these atoms are 0.14 nanometers. And previously before that, um, that was never able to be seen um, with a uncorrected microscope. And so applications of an aberration corrected microscope is that it really allows you to see uh, things at the atomic scale and gives you atomic information. You know, looking at things at the atomic scale gives you, um, helps you understand things a little bit better. And so, and especially when things such as this, which is a fin found in a MOSFET transistor and semiconductor materials, right? The devices are getting smaller and smaller and um, we, they need to understand what or characterize these materials. And as you reach, you know, just, you know, making things just a few atoms thick, it's really nice to have an aberration corrector that uh, lets you see such details. And so here, uh, this is a fin, and you'll see the silicon crystal within this fin here, and you have these other layers surrounding it. And so just uh, for a little kind of, blurb here is that, you know, this is a transistor and this is found in all uh, processing devices, you know, especially in your computers or phones and things like that. So it's really amazing that they can produce and manufacture such, you know, with such precision in, you know, tiny, like little devices. Um, another application, or this is just another example, is that it really allows you to see, you know, changes at the atomic scale. Uh, in this case, it was an in, in situ heating experiment in which it, if you, uh, it allowed researchers to see uh, gold in the quasi-molten state. So the several different states of this quasi-molten gold and um, track its transformation. And so it allowed researchers to view the surface structure and the um, orientations um, that occurred as it was heated. And this, uh, you know, it's really nice and clear and really nice to see this at the atomic scale. You know, things are, it was, it was proposed and theorized, but uh, never actually seen until this microscope, uh, an aberration corrector was installed. Okay, so that's just a short little overview um, for you guys. And so it's kind of like leads into the, this uh, talk. So first it's important to kind of understand uh, lens aberrations and where do they come from? And then we'll go into the atomy, uh, anatomy, anatomy of the image correctors. And then I'll end with like a short little blurb on practical tips for high resolution imaging. And so I know, you know, this is uh, heavily, this, this term is, you know, used, image corrector is used for TM applications, but I'd say, you know, uh, as microscopists, it's very important to understand, you know, when you're imaging something, you're using lenses and these lenses come with aberrations. And so it's something good to keep in the back of your mind. Uh, when you are imaging anything in the microscope. Okay, so moving on to lenses in the electron microscope. I'm sure many of you uh, are familiar with this, but let's just quick, quickly uh, kind of go over it just as a reminder. And so we have um, the lenses in the microscope are uh, round converging lenses, uh, one is shown here. And so we focus um, electrons using, you know, a magnetic field, right? And so what is unique about these round lenses is that their focusing ability, uh, they, they are able to just, you know, converge the beam into a point. 
and they are not able to uh, act as a convex lens that, um, you know, uh, deflects the beam outwards away from the optical axis. And so why that is? Well, um, if we look at the magnetic field in the lenses, um, we see that uh, the, coil, the, the, the magnetic field of the lenses, the coils produce. And so these are the magnetic field lines and um, an electron will travel down here and interact with this magnetic field. And so uh, experience, you know, a force on it called um, the Lorentz force. And it's dependent on the velocity of the electron. So vector, um, the velocity vector and the uh, magnetic uh, components uh, that really uh, drives the electron in a different direction or deflects it. And so it starts to take on this helical path and this period, you know, is defined. This helix, the pitch of this helix, defined by the velocity um, of the, you know, source. And so, the faster, or the faster it's traveling, or you know, the higher kV you have, the smaller the pitch. And um, one thing I also want to note is that the magnetic field is inhomogeneous, meaning that um, the strength. Did I mention this? The strength of the field. Uh, get stronger the farther away from you travel from the optical axis here. So you'll feel a, the electron will feel a greater uh, Lorentz force, uh, say more so in this region than uh, if it was closer to the optical axis. And so because of this, um, you know, it, it traveled in this helical path, uh, we can kind of, you know, we have to character or define this uh, path. And so it's kind of, this uh, is done so, you know, in these uh, planes here. And so we have the meridional plane um, that's parallel with the, the Z axis. And then we have, or the optical axis, and then we have the radial plane here, um, which is kind of going to be important. And so uh, say an electron is uh, this position P and we can define it by, uh, the radius and the azimuth angle uh, that it makes. And so, okay, because it's, now we know that the electron is traveling in the helical path. And so when it, um, the trajectory of this, you know, uh, electron takes on different angles. And so, that's called the inclination angle at which it enters uh, the uh, magnetic field. And um, the angle of the trajectories uh, defines like the focal length or where it will end up or intersect with the optical uh, axis. And so we'll, we'll see here that, you know, if it enters at a small angle, you know, it ends up uh, at a farther distance. Um, then a, a, a point where, it, you know, an electron has a greater inclination angle is going to end up um, at a shorter distance uh, on the optical axis. And so this kind of leads or gives way to, or explains, I'd say, the, the effect of spherical aberrations. And so because you have these different inclination angles, these, uh, they intersect at the image plane, they intersect at different points along the um, optical axis. And so what results from this really is that um, you get what should have been a point, but is now a disc. And so um, that's seen here. And the radius of this disc is dependent, as you can see, is dependent on the aberration coefficient and the angle that it is traveling. And um, yes, okay. And then, um, so we have, uh, you can see here at this point, this disc is a lot larger. The diameter is a lot larger than um, something that's over here. And so this is referred to as the plane of least confusion where you have, you can minimize um, your, uh, your aberration effect by 
actually moving this plane of least confusion to your image plane. And so um, this is just the panel just showing um, how, you know, that point evolves as your focus, as you change your focus and, and move that focal point, you know, I guess along the optical axis, um, you'll see that it changes, the diameter changes of this um, point as we change focus. Okay, so um, what I just described is what is called a geometrical aberration. And so geometrical aberration uh, is basically, you know, an aberration where there's errors in the optical path lens, right? And so CS or spherical aberration is an example of that. Um, and it results in a disc. And so another, the other kind of aberration um, that we have here is the chromatic aberration. And so if you are familiar with uh, Isabel's talk last month, uh, you probably fully understand this now, but, um, you know, because, you know, our point source, uh, it, it's more of a Gaussian, you know, we have a range of energies um, coming from our point source. And so the lenses uh, focus that. And so the, but the uh, energies, electrons with the energy, with the lower energy is, fo is focused at a closer distance um, than, electrons with a higher energy and they're focused, you know, at a point farther away along the optical axis. And so it kind of results in an image like this. So kind of very similar to geometrical or spherical aberration, except that this arises from changes or differences in energy spread of the beam, as opposed to, you know, the lens's ability to focus um, the electrons at a certain point. And so both of these um, types of aberrations, chromatic and geometrical, occur in your microscope. Um, is you know doesn't matter what kind of you know, if you're using an SEM or TEM, but there is one that dominates more than the other. Um, and so let's kind of look into that. Why is that? Well, um, if you look at this resolution, so the the resolution def uh, defined or limited by the spherical aberration is given by this equation. And then the resolution limiting, or the, sorry, okay, the resolution uh, that's limited by the chromatic aberration is given by this equation here, okay? And then we plot this out. Um, and you look at the values for the aberration of, of either CS or CC and the resulting resolution. And so CS here is shown in red and CC is shown in blue. And so um, for example, for a one kV beam, so kind of like in, in the SEM range, you'll see that um, CC really dominates. So, you know, as you change your uh, chromatic aberration, right, so you, you change your chromatic aberration coefficient that has an effect, a greater effect on your resolution as opposed to spherical aberration. Um, and then when we come to the TM range, we have kind of the opposite where um, spherical aberration really dominates the resolution um, of this microscope. And so uh, what we do for the TM is we really address these spherical aberrations. And in the SEM, they kind of want to focus on the chromatic aberrations. And so you'll see, you know, SEMs have monochromators or, you know, ways to uh, have a more uh, uniform energy spread of the, of the beam or the source. Okay. Um, okay. And then Additionally, okay, so there's uh, something that we should also talk about, which is the ax axial approximation. And so CS and CC are axial aberrations. And so that just basically means that no matter where uh, the point lies in the image plane, you get the same uh, amount of aberration for each point. So it doesn't depend on the azimuth angle. And uh, 
oh, yeah, the theft increases with increasing inclination angle. And so uh, leading way to, you know, you get the same resolution for all image points, and this is referred to the isoplanic approximation. So this is just kind of uh, an image just showing, you know, uh, points along the image plane, and they are all, the aberration is the same for all points in this plane. Okay, and then you also have off axial aberrations. And so this um, is where, so this is the same thing. So this is just showing coma, which is an off axial aberration. And um, you can see here that as, you know, the amount of aberration that you get, varies along this image plane. And so it really limits, you know, the number of equally well resolved image points, you know, the ones closer uh, along the center are um, more clear and defined. And so this, you know, leads way to, you know, defines or limits your field of view and um, becomes the resolution limiting factor for points beyond the maximum number of equally resolved image points. So, you know, the farther away you go, the more aberration that you have, off actual aberrations that you have, and then you'll just have a more blurry image uh, the farther out you go. So what is coma and how do you get this? Well, um, coma, so it's an off axial aberration. And so you have an object, you know, a point that's not on the optical axis and it um, gets focused by the beam and it focuses at different positions in the image plane. And this kind of results in a comet-like sh shape, I guess, to it. And um, so it's called, oh, this is oh yeah, it's, it's the right one. Okay, oh, I don't have it on here, but you know, it looks like a, com a comet, right? You have a tail, a large tail. And, and um, so what should be a point is more like a comet. And so because, uh, you know, we have the Lorentz force and the trajectory, the helical path, um, these comas can be defined by different, you know, we have the radial coma and then we have, it, it has an angle dependence. So it can, that's uh, this azimuth coma here. And so, you know, the, you can see that, you know, the greater, farther out we go, the greater the effect and this is when you add them together um, on the image plane, you can kind of get something like this. Um, and then this is just showing, you know, point um, on the image plane and how that point or the, the coma changes as you change focus. And so you'll see, you know, uh, along one edge, it's a little bit more brighter than and focus than regions um, on the other end of that uh, point, right? Okay, and then there's also astigmatism, which is where the, oh, okay. Oh, I guess I left that in there. Okay, so, but, uh, so the lenses, so you have the X and Y, and so the, along um, one axis, it focuses the beam more than, uh, than on, the beam is focused more along one axis than on the other axis. And so this results in a more elliptical shape to your beam. Um, and so you can see here that, you know, as you change focus, you know, you have your ellipse is gonna go this way, I guess in the X, y, it, X direction, um, you come to the point of least confusion and then you change it to focus and you get this ellipse uh, converts uh, to, along this, to be oriented along the what the y direction, and so you can see here that as you change focus, um, you'll see that these uh, orientation of these ellipses change, and so that's like you know one way to tell if you have astigmatism is if you change your focus, and you'll see that you, the the image kind of stretches in one direction, and you go through focus, and it stretches in the other direction then that's, you know, a clear sign that you have a little bit of astigmatism. Okay, so uh, these are all, you know, these geometrical uh, aberrations we just kind of show as rays, but it's also, you know, of course, you know, electrons are 
oh, did I say rays? Rays. And then electrons, you know, are also travel as waves. You know, you have these wave fronts and it inter interacts with your sample and it's focused, right? So um, this is more commonly seen for, I guess, image correctors and people that look into aberrations at the atomic scale. Um, but just to kind of summarize, right, you have a wave front, uh, you have your lens and it's focused to a point. And so an aberration arises where there's changes. You have an aberration uh, wave front as well. And that interacts with the ideal, uh, changes the, from the ideal spherical wave front to this kind of wavy wave front here. And then it's focused, you know, a different, you have different focal points or focal lengths here. Um, and so this is just describing, this is just showing like the aberration equation uh, a little much, I know, but it's just showing that this wave function, uh, you can combine it with, you know, certain aberration coefficients to kind of give you the aberration equation, okay? And so what is important really here is that you have these aberration coefficients that kind of describe uh, the kind of different aberrations that you have. And um, they are described by, you know, they have sym symmetry, uh, symmetry and then there's order and um, each one changes and is very similar. Um, they, uh, it's like a Taylor expansion show, so it goes out forever, but I'm just showing the first three here. And so the first one is just tilt. Uh, we have, you know, defocus, uh, we have astigmatism, Right, and then we have coma, which is this uh, for second order uh, with the symmetry of one. Um, I also have astigmatism, which is a threefold astigmatism. So the one that we normally encounter, I guess, when you when you uh, image is you know it's just your twofold astigmatism. But we there's also threefold astigmatism. Um, then we come to a third order uh, aberrations, which is our spherical aberration. We have the star aberration, and then we have this fourfold astigmatism. Okay, so uh, just another way to think about aberrations, but um, yeah, this aberration coefficients you'll see uh, comes into play in a little bit. Okay, so back to, I guess, spherical aberration. And so uh, what is kind of unfortunate or just, not, it's just an effect that results from having round, um, magnetic lenses is that uh, these aberrations are unavoidable. You're not able to produce a lens that has no chromatic or no spherical aberration. And this was realized in 1936 by uh, Otto Scherzer. And um, he has this, sh uh, he um, showed that if round lenses, um, Round magnetic lenses will always have positive CS and, and CC. If they are rotationally symmetric, um, there's no charge on the axis or the fields do not vary with time. And so, uh, you know, the, before then, or I guess before image correctors were um, made, right, they tried to just reduce spherical aberrations, but you can never avoid it. So one way is that you can, uh, to reduce your spherical aberration is to decrease your focal length, right? So if you decrease your focal length, um, you'll kind of minimize uh, this, you know, uh, disc to more so of a disc of radius of the disc of least confusion. Okay. And then um, uh, from the previous couple of slides, um, you'll see that you're resolution limited, uh, which, what should I say? The spherical aberration limited resolution is, uh, you know, has your spherical aberration coefficient, but it's also has this wavelength um, factor uh, in it. And so you can also try to reduce your spherical aberration by um, increasing your, uh, the, your, Beam, the wavelength of your beam, right? But, um, you know, these uh, researchers, pioneers, sought to completely remove CS 
And so uh, Scherzer said that you must violate one of these principles to get a lens uh, that can have no CS, basically. And so this is a kind of an interesting paper if you're interested in history. Um, this paper kind of talks about the history of you know how aberration characters came to be. You know, this this uh, he sure proposed this in 1936, but it wasn't until what is this 19 so 1998. So you know, 70 years later, where they actually have an image corrector to uh, address CS or fix CS in the microscope. Uh, it's a very long story, but um, you know they tried different, tried to make different lenses uh, that violate these, and it turns out that the best way to do this is you know um, don't or uh, abandon uh, having rotationally symmetric lenses. Okay, but um, so in nine. 1936 and 19 until you know I guess in 1998 is when the first image corrector was uh, was revealed I guess and so uh, by these you know pioneers here very common popular names in high resolution microscopy um, but they produced or uh, they uh, made an image corrector. And they, you know, in, inserted it into the back focal plane of the ejective lens, and um, it was added onto this Philips CM two hundred uh, with equipped with a two hundred kb FEG, and um, normally without uh, these con without a corrector, you know, these are the conditions. So it has, you know, the objective focal length is one point six millimeters. Uh, it has spherical aberration value of one point two three millimeters. Uh, chromatic uh, value of 1.3. And so this, uh, because this was inserted is very large uh, and it increased the column height by, you know, 24 centimeters. But the good thing about it is that it doesn't affect other parts of the microscopes, the other lenses. You can just insert it. And so uh, what is, you know, what are the parts of this image corrector? Um, well, that's shown here, and how does it work, and why does it work? Well, uh, they just basically abandoned the use of round lenses, and instead they use multiple lenses. Um, so, such example is shown here, where you have this hexapole lens, and instead, um, so you don't have a, you instead you have these poles, and you magnetize these poles, and um, that uh, is used to focus, uh, or you know fix the aberrations, but this itself is not a very good lens either. Um, you have to have additional lenses uh, to fix other aberrations that are, are made when using these lenses. And so the image character itself is one of the most simplest kind of uh, assembly. Uh, you'll see here that there's two kind of subunits here. There's, you know, this region here and another region here, they're symmetrical. So these are two round lenses. You have this hexapole lenses, another set of round lenses, and then another hexapole lens. And then um, this is the objective lens. So it's placed right here and it just changes. We'll, 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 we'll see that in a bit. Okay. But the idea here is that this produces negative CS. And so it counteracts the positive CS that um, is made by the objective lens. So effectively reducing the overall uh, spherical aberration value that you get. Um, yeah, and it has symmetri uh, symmetrical subunits. Um, so uh, this is just one type of image uh, corrector. So I should just say corrector. Um, there are other correctors that utilize, you know, other arrangements of multipoles. Uh, so there's quadrupoles and there's octopoles. Um, and, but specifically for, so the quadrupole and octopoles are mainly used for um, forming a probe. So for STEM applications, um, that's in the neon there. But uh, for, I guess, broad beam uh, imaging, 
broadband imaging, uh, we have this hexapole uh, corrector here. And so we'll talk a little bit, let's kind of focus on this one here, this arrangement. Um, Okay, so a little bit about multiple lenses, right? So uh, I think many, many of you already are familiar with it. Um, so we have the quadrupoles, right? And these are in your stigmators. And so here you have uh, two poles here wrapped in the coil to produce your magnetic field. And the uh, field lines travel from the north to the south uh, pole pieces. Um, and the, 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 I'd say the poles are changed by just reversing the direction of the current running through these uh, coils um, that are wrapped around the poles here. And so um, these field lens lines, you know, they look like this instead of, you know, a round kind of, I guess, shape that you get with a uh, round lens. Okay. So, um, what is unique about these lenses. And so, of course, we have the Lorentz force. And so when an electron interacts with this, you know, it, it encounters a force and it is deflected at a certain, in a certain way. And so when you have this kind of uh, setup here, um, this kind of symmetrical setup here, and so you have electrons that are, you know, traveling along the X axis, or not traveling along, sorry, it's traveling along the z-axis, but it's positioned you know, along the x-axis. Uh, they are stretched, the, the force pulls them out this way. So they're kind of stretched uh, out this way and the, the, along the y-axis, it's pushed more closer or pushed or deflected towards the optical axis. Okay, and so um, this is kind of, you can kind of think of it as like, a converging, in one axis, right, you have a con converging effect, like, like a con, con uh, sorry, a converging lens, and then you have, along this x-axis, you have, you know, it acts as like a convex lens, right, and so the resulting, you know, uh, beam that you get in the image plane uh, is referred to as kind of like a line focus, right, so it's kind of stretched, and squished in this direction, stretch in this direction, you end up with more of a line here. And so you can see um, this, you can kind of see how this would address astigmatism, right? An elliptical uh, beam. And so um, this is what, you know, just one quadrupole does. So uh, what we need to do though, is put two in tandem or uh, two in series, I guess. And so uh, what they do, so you need to have one that focus, you know, has a line full side, and then you have another one rotated perpendicular to the, these, this orientation, and you can get the opposite effect, right? So it'll stretch in this way, and the other one will stretch it this way, um, and you can kind of form a nice round stigmatic point uh, that is formed in the image plane. So you need to have uh, two of these in uh, together to have to reduce your aberration, your astigmatism. Um, okay, so then, oh, I also like to talk about the uh, symmetry of these multipoles, okay? And because um, the symmetry kind of gets, helps you describe the aberrations that arise from having these kinds of lenses. And so we have the multiplicity here. Um, 2m, and m is defined by the poles, the number of symmetrical poles. And so for a quadrupole, you have two. Uh, for a hexapole, you have three. So a total of six poles, but the, plus the number of symmetrical poles is uh, three. And then an octopole, you have four, and so on. And so uh, you can determine what kind of aberrations these um, kinds of lenses make uh, by, you know, just looking at this order. So you, you have this, the order uh, is defined by N, which is one, sorry, the, the number of symmetrical poles minus one. So for uh, a uh, quadrupole, 
it's going to be two minus one. So it's one. And then the symmetry component um, is just going to be the number of symmetrical poles that you have. So the order is one per quadrupole. The symmetry component average uh, is two. Okay. So then we, you know, come here and we'll see the order one and symmetry two. And so these uh, quadrupoles uh, cause a twofold astigmatism in your beam. Okay. And um, all right. So let, let's talk about the hexapoles, which is uh, important and the main component or one of the main components in the image corrector. Um, so you have a hexapole, it has three symmetrical uh, poles, right? And um, so the order is uh, three minus one is two. And so that gives rise to, just tells you, you have three fold astigmatism. So this uh, uh, hexapole gives rise to a three fold astigmatism in your wave. Okay. And so same thing, um, let's kind of look at what happens when we arrange two together, um, which is done uh, for your image character, you have two hexapoles. Um, so here's your first hexapole here and here's your second hexapole here. Um, and this is how, um, what is done to have negative CS in your wave. Um, and so let's kind of look at, so you have uh, an incoming electron here and an incoming electron here. They lie along the same uh, positions, just in opposite axes. So it's kind of like here. And um, they interact with the field of the hexapole lens and they're deflected by a certain angle. And so since the position of these are the same, they, they enter at the same kind of position relative to, uh, I guess, the corrector, they're deflected, and then um, they then move on to the second hexapole, right? And, um, oh gosh, okay. And then uh, they're also deflected by a certain angle, okay? And so um, what they do, what is really kind of happening here is that when you put two together, uh, when, the, the first one deflects to a certain at a certain angle and puts this this electron at a different position uh, relative to this this uh, this electron here and so uh, because we have an inhomogeneous uh, magnetic field uh, the strength rate the strength is stronger in this region than regions along the optical axis the Lorentz force that it feels is a lot smaller. Uh, than this one here. So it feels a lot greater uh, force. So it's deflected um, um, with the greater force. And so they uh, have these long hexapoles. And so uh, as it travels, right, the, the longer it encounters this hexapole field, the greater this uh, deflection that occurs, okay? And, uh, but one, one thing that's different than the, than what we have for the stigmators that they're um, not rotated. They have the same azimuth orientation. And so um, when you have two together, you're really going to uh, increase or accentuate, I guess, uh, your threefold astigmatism that is, that is made. Uh, by these lenses. And so what kind of happens is that, uh, yeah, if you just increase this, it kind of, we, we, oh, sorry, we have this uh, hexa, these transfer lenses here, okay? So this kind of is like inserted here between the two hexapoles to minimize or reduce that third order uh, stigmatism that we don't really want in our image, okay? So um, let's talk a little bit about these transfer lenses and uh, the first set of transfer lenses. And so what they do is that they really fix um, coma in your beam, right? So you don't want any aberrations in here before it travels into your hexapole. So you really have to minimize and fix that. And so that's what these do here. 
uh, and then it can image it, uh, a coma-free beam onto this first hexapole. And then uh, it travels to this you know, sec second set of transfer lenses. And what this does is that it images uh, this beam um, onto the second hexapole, but with a magnification of negative one. And what this does is that it, it vanishes uh, this third order aberration. So you really, you know, squish it down and then you can kind of get rid of that third aberration and take care of those uh, spherical aberration uh, rays, right? So this is the axial rays. So the rays, the axial rays are not really affected, but we have the paraxial rays are the ones uh, that are at high angle to the optical axis. So, you know, we can change their directory, uh, directory, their trajectory that way, okay? Um, and so uh, really the system, it allows control. So it doesn't just correct for just CS, right? It, it corrects, you know, first, second and third order geometrical aberrations, axial aberrations. Um, uh, one disadvantage is that it, it increases the chromatic uh, aberrations by a factor of 1.5 to two, and then an uncorrected microscope. So a corrected microscope has a little bit more uh, chromatic aberrations than an uncorrected. And then, um, but the advantage is that here is that your information limit, you know, still, it's still not limited. That, cr that chromatic aberration doesn't have a huge effect or as great as effect, right, on your uh, HM resolution. So we are, or they are able to increase the resolution by a factor of 1.2. Okay, so um, also here, uh, what is very important, right, is that you need to have a coma-free beam. And so that is actually uh, done. We need to have it really accurately measured and address these aberrations and reduce them. So what uh, they do in CIOS is to uh, use what was called, what is called, you know, the Zim Zimlin tableau to uh, really measure and uh, fix these you know, the, the coma in there. So what this does really is that um, it takes, you have an, you image an amorphous material, uh, takes uh, a diffractogram, so an FFT of that image, and uh, it measures, you know, the defocus and the twofold astigmatism. And then it's gonna proceed by tilting uh, the beam and uh, rotating it in, in azimuthal increments. Uh, and so these uh, coma, especially, right, or some these off-axis aberrations, they'll be greatly enhanced if they are, you know, you can see them better or measure them uh, if they, if you tilt the beam. And so it's kind of like shown here, right? You tilt, you have, it, you can see it, it's enhanced in one direction, say, okay, that's there. And so what they do, you know, they tilt, take images, tilt, and then rotate and uh, all around. And then you can kind of, from this, uh, you, you can measure the defocus and the two-fold astigmatism. And from that, they back calculate and then they, they can put that into the aberration correct uh, equation and figure out what are the other aberrations, the values for the other aberration coefficients. And then they uh, fix these lenses to address or minimize those that coma and those other aberrations. And then um, you repeat the process again. So you it's an iterative process. You tilt measure, you know, tilt measure, and uh, try to minimize the aberrations as much as possible. And then it, it allows for a really good column. Uh, corrector alignment, right? So that is what uh, this CIOS does, is that they use the Zimlin tableau to uh, fix those aberrations. And so uh, after all of that is done, um, as again, you know, you have uh, a beam that can resolve uh, information of higher spatial frequencies, right? And uh, that's what I showed earlier today, but this is, you know, what was calculated for their uncorrected and corrected microscope. Uh, 
on their JL200 at 200 kV. And so it really just shows that uh, for an uncorrected microscope, your spherical aberration uh, goes from 1.23 to 0.05 or, you know, 50 microns. Uh, so it decreased, you know, by a lot. I think I put that in right. Maybe it's 0.5. Oh, sorry, it should be 0.5. Okay. And then um, the chromatic uh, aberrations, though, you can see that it, the values change from 1.3 to 1.7. So it increased just a tiny little bit. Um, this is just a sharing of focus to uh, produce or calculate these curves. Um, and you'll see here that the you know, information limit or the point resolution for the uncorrected microscope is around two. And then we can really, uh, for a corrected microscope, we can really uh, approach the information limit here. And you'll also see that, um, that the, uh, we get a lot of contrast right, transfer for higher uh, spatial frequencies. So we can really see, it allows us to really see those, you know, really tiny, fine details. And although we do, you know, have it in a uncorrected microscope, right, um, the spherical aberration just kind of blurs it out, is hard, makes it hard to interpret, okay? And so it just, this kind of just shows, you know, it's, we have really much, better resolution when we insert an image corrector into our column. Okay, uh, but one, you know, one disadvantage is that, you know, it increases the, the height of the column, um, just 24 centimeters for just one, but then if you have two, so sometimes you'll see the term, you know, double corrected TEM, that means it has two correctors. And so there's one corrector in uh, for the, uh, image for the for broad beam image, you know, and then one, the pro corrector. So you really fix the, uh, the lenses that form the probe, the aberrations, in the lens that forms the probe, the stem probe, right? So you have a more fine, fine, uh, beam. And so really that just increases the height of the microscope. Um, you need to have you know, really stable uh, environment, right? And so when you look at things at such tiny, uh, at such a small scale, um, you may be able to have the ability to see them, but if your region or environment is not stable, you know, you have a lot of noise, um, you're not gonna be able to see this. So you can't really utilize uh, that type of microscope really well. Um, but, Nonetheless, if you have all this, oh, it's also very expensive, right, too. It's just very expensive. Um, so not a lot of, you know, uh, microscopes are equipped with them, you know, otherwise we probably would. And, um, but yeah, there are ways to reduce CS, uh, even if you don't have a corrector. So that, that, that's, there's still advantages there. That's still pretty good. So really, if you're really going into the atomic, you know, want to explore the atomic realm and information uh, from your sample, uh, yes, the image corrector would be very beneficial for you or aberration corrected microscope would be ben very beneficial for you. But if not, um, you know, regular TEM, you know, nowadays the, uh, the, the lenses are made to really reduce CS. Um, and it, it does a really, they're, they're pretty nice now. So, yeah. Okay, so uh, just like a little last slide for um, imaging. So those of you that have access to an aberration corrected microscope, um, you know, you can't just walk in and then, you know, take a really good atomic image, right? Uh, just a few tips. So you, it really is important to have really good alignment into the corrector, right? If, you, if your beam is already, has a lot of, you know, axial, off axial aberrations, um, the correctors aren't gonna be able to do its job. It's not gonna give you, it's not gonna reduce CS. Um, and so that's very, that's one thing. Um, another thing is that when you, you know, have such a small field of view, uh, you, you focus the, the beam into, you know, a smaller region on your, on your sample, it's, you're very prone to contamination. Uh, and that really just adds what I like to say, like a layer of dirt on your sample while you're imaging, right? So if, you, if you're just trying to 
uh, image something and you it's it, you have a layer interfering with it, right? You, you can't see those fine details. So it's really important to have clean samples um, and things that won't, you know, try to reduce, you know, carbon contamination in your beam. It's also very important to have thin samples. So for TEM, um, the thinner it is, the better, basically. And uh, you also want to have a certain zone axis in mind when you're trying to image. So you need to orient the beam along a certain zone axis to see down those atomic columns. Um, and it's very helpful to have, you know, what, what zone axis that you want to see beforehand, before you actually go and try to tilt it in the microscope. Um, and then you also want to think about probe current and your KV, right? So the higher um, the KV or higher the, the speed of the electrons, the greater resolution that you have. But then you also kind of run into the issues of uh, knock-on damage. Um, your, beat, your sample could just degrade uh, right in the microscope, and then you can't see your high-resolution information. Uh, but um, yeah, so uh, you can go to lower KVs and then there are, you know, our image correctors do work at 80 KV as well. So it's really nice that we can do that. Um, and then also, right, it's very important to have a good detector um, or a well-tuned detector. So that's very easy sometimes to come on the microscope and your detector has uh, some, I guess some say the, per Pre, the person previously did, you know, diffraction and kind of oversaturated the camera and that's going to produce, you know, an, a shadow in your image that you're trying to acquire. So always just make sure that you kind of do your gain, um, make sure that there's no uh, residual charges or there's noticeable charges left, in, left on your detector and things like that. Um, but yeah, okay. Uh, so with that, I guess that will come to an end. Um, it's like, a, I talked about a lot of things and there's, this subject is very, very complex. Um, but I think if you would like to learn a little bit more, I really highly recommend this book, uh, the by Rolf Ernie, it's the Aberration Corrected Imaging and Transmission Electron Microscopy. It's a very, very good book. Makes it, it's very clear and easy to read. Um, it's good place to start if you want to learn a little bit more. Okay, so thank you all for your attention and I'd be happy to take any questions. Natalie, great presentation and I totally agree. That's like one of my favorite it's books such in the a world. I love it so much. <laughs> but yeah, all you guys like told me about it and then I was like, wow, this is really good. And yeah. So there is a couple of questions. Um, okay. The first question, and please, if you have, if there's more questions, put them in the Q&A. We're gonna take some time now to go through them. Um, could you please explain what, what does the inclination angle mean? I think this okay. is when you were talking about CS at the beginning. Yeah, and so that really is like the angle kind of um, to the optical axis, right, of that this electron is traveling. Um, it's kind of complicated because you also have, okay, so you're, the electrons are spinning and they have a helix, but then they're also like this helix is like being squished like towards the outer, and anyways, there's an angle there. It's, it's There's angle change there. But basically we'll just say that the inclination angle is the angle that this ray uh, is at relative to the optical axis. Great. Um, can you comment on negative CS imaging for uh, lightweight atoms? Lightweight atoms. Yeah, well, um, I guess like in itself, uh, it, you know, it's kind of possible as long as you use a high energy beam or, you know, 300 kV beam that gives you the greatest resolution. So it's, you can really see smaller information for like a say a lighter atom but um it is so you, you know it's easy to see carbon uh graphene uh i mean it's not easy relatively right well i mean you can see it um carbon definitely doable yeah it's just that you have to worry or you be very mindful of 
knock on damage and what you uh, are doing with what's happening to your sample under that, that um, beam. Hey, jump in on that a little too, since graphene imaging was my life for yeah. seven years. <laughs> so um, as Natalie mentioned, especially for graphene and other lightweight atoms, you have to be really um, careful about the knock-on damage. That's generally the primary um, form of damage in those types of materials. Uh, so typically, um, graphene, I believe, knock-on damage is below, they say 80 kV, I think it's like 86 kb is what they say theoretically, but if anyone's looked at graphene on the microscope, you know at 80 kb you still get damage. Um, so a lot of imaging is then done closer at 30 or 60 kb if possible, in which case negative CS imaging is really important. If you remember the equations that Natalie showed, CS is related to wavelength. So the lower the energy, um, of your beam, the higher your CS is going to be. Uh, so that is a major limitation when viewing uh, lightweight atoms that when you have to think about knock on damage. So having the image corrector is 100% necessary uh, for atomic lattice imaging of graphene or similar materials. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, another question is comma aberration part of an inherent defect of electron microscopy or has it other causes? Uh, yes, I would say it is an inherent, uh, I guess, aberration, but that is it's easier to uh, fix in, in, in uh, for electron microscopy. It's easier to fix. Um, so that's why we, they kind of focus on CS or spherical aberration because you can't really fix that. But there is, there is a coma in, I guess, I, I hope I'm understanding this correctly. There is coma in, in, in your lenses um, or by the image produced by these lenses, but at least they're easier to fix than circle aberration. Yeah, and I, I think just to add on that, because aberrations were my life for so long um, and uh, you're <laughs> flooding all these memories back. Yeah. Um, no. <laughs> so with our optical lenses, CS is the limiting aberration um, without the corrector. So you still are gonna have all those ab other aberrations, but it's your CS that's really limiting the resolution, which is why um, the correctors focus so much on creating those negative CS images. Um, and again, just to get on to the negative CS imaging, it is also needed to create contrast. We, you sort of mentioned it and it's apparent in the equations that actually you need a bit of defocus and CS to actually get contrast in your images. Mm -hmm. um, if those are, if all aberrations are zero, you just get a white image. Mm -hmm. um, that's really what makes TEM very complicated is you need to understand your aberrations uh, and you need aberrations, in fact, to get some contrast in your image. Mm -hmm. um, so it's TEM is, I always say, much more difficult than STEM um, in terms of if you're just looking at HAADF images where mm -hmm. you get the nice, mm -hmm. nice contrast. But right. TEM, you have to consider all these different diffraction effects. Mm -hmm. um, so to image carbon atoms in graphene in HRTM, do we also need to correct CC in addition to correcting CS? Not so much, actually. So it doesn't, you're still able to, so graphene, I guess, I, I don't know at the top of my head, but the spacing for graphene uh, is definitely greater than the resolution of a CS corrected microscope. So you wouldn't need, you know, to fix it, you would gain very, very probably unnoticeable effects if you corrected for CC, um, for graphene especially. Also, I might I jump in on that, Natalie. Yeah. Also, <laughs> I have image graphene at 300 kV, so it's doable. It just depends on the sample, really. If it's a single sheet of graphene, yeah, a single sheet, 300 is going to destroy it, demolish it. Yeah. Um, so that's the thing with graphene. A lot of people say they have graphene uh, above even five layers at that point. It's almost graphite. Yeah. Um, but 
it is oh. just the feel. That's what that's how it goes, especially if you're working with powders. If you're looking at single sheet, you can image without CS. I did it for years. Um, in those cases, like the negative CS question, that's you want to work in negative CS conditions um, to get your contrast. Uh, but generally, you'd excite your monochromator um, to help limit the CC because once you correct CS when you're working at such low KVs, mm. uh, CC then dominates. Mm -hmm. So you don't need a CC corrector. That just adds an added complication. Um, you will get much better images if you have a CC mm -hmm. and a CS corrector. It is not 100% necessary. You, you can use your monochromator. I would also like to add that there, there's also monochromators and CC correctors for Essians as well. As well. So uh, yeah. Yeah, it's crazy how much everything has changed since 90, 1998. Like yeah. once we got the correctors in place, just so much has changed with imaging. Yes. <laughs>